Tom. And I'm Martine. Martine and I have made thousands of tie-dyes over the years. T-shirts, tapestries, dresses, children's clothing, and a whole host of other things. We've traveled to art shows, music festivals, and street fairs all over the United States. Chances are you've seen someone wearing one of our tie-dyes, or maybe you even own one yourself. We've decided to pass the knowledge and secrets of making extraordinary tie-dye on to you. Making your own tie-dyes is a wonderful way to express your individuality. You'll get to pick the colors you will use and decide on the patterns to fold. When things don't come out just as you planned in your imagination, sometimes the unexpected results are even better than the ones you were planning for. This presentation will teach you all the basics of making exceptional tie-dye. You'll learn the materials and supplies you need, and we'll talk about the do's and don'ts of mixing chemicals and dye. Then we'll fold, dye, and wash out our project. It is important to emphasize that when making tie-dye, you will be handling chemicals. The chemicals you will be handling are considered safe for home use when handled properly. They are generally considered safer than common household products such as drain cleaner, oven cleaner, pesticides, and bleach. However, when handling any chemicals, it is important to handle them all with the utmost care. Don't eat, drink, or smoke in the presence of dyes and other chemicals. Never use kitchen utensils or appliances for the tie-dyeing process unless they will be permanently retired from use in food preparation and consumption. Always store dye and other chemicals in a safe location, out of the reach of pets and small children. After learning the materials in this video presentation, you'll be prepared to move on and do some more advanced tie-dye techniques. Advanced tie-dye techniques, making shapes and mandalas, is a two-volume set it includes tie-dye 202, making shapes with tie-dye, and tie-dye 303, mandalas, suns, and lotus blossoms. In tie-dye 202, you'll learn how to make all sorts of shapes including hearts, peace signs, the alien, and more. In tie-dye 303, you'll learn the secrets behind making mandalas, suns, lotus blossoms, and more. We'll show you every step in the process, and you'll be on your way to making incredible tie-dye designs of your own. Advanced tie-dye techniques, the next step in putting your imagination on fabric. As we get ready to tie-dye, the first decisions we need to make are what kind of dye to use and what kind of fibers we're going to dye. We're going to use Procyon MX fiber reactive dye. Procyon MX is not to be confused with other fiber reactive dyes such as Procyon H. Many companies repackage and sell Procyon MX dye, so the first thing you'll want to do is verify with your supplier that the dye you're buying is Procyon MX. Next, we'll need to decide what colors we're going to use. Some suppliers refer to the same colors with different names, and some suppliers blend two or more Procyon dye powders to create a signature color. These colors will not be available anywhere else. Luckily, all of the fundamental colors of Procyon MX dye also have generic names or codes. Thus, yellow MX8G can be used to identify a standard color, whether your supplier calls it lemon yellow or sun yellow. In this video presentation, we will be referring to the Procyon dye powders with our supplier's name, followed by the generic name. Now we'll need some dye. Let's start with lemon, yellow, MX8G, fuchsia, red, MX8B, turquoise, MXG, cobalt, blue, MX2G, and black, MXCWNA, or whichever black your supplier says is the darkest. The primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. In theory, every other color can be produced from various mixtures of these three primaries. 
In practice, we'll need four colors of Procyon MX dye to use as primaries, yellow, fuchsia, turquoise, and cobalt blue, and we will also need black. Our second major decision will be what kind of fabric to dye. Procyon MX dyes can be used in all cellulose fibers, such as cotton, rayon, and hemp. Procyon MX can also be used with silk, even though it's a protein fiber. Petroleum-based synthetic fibers, such as nylon, polyester, and acrylic, cannot be dyed using Procyon MX. Often, fabrics are treated with various chemicals like optical whiteners, wrinkle-free treatments, sizing and starch, and even flame retardants. The problem with these treatments is that they interfere with the dyeing process. Some of these additives can be removed by scouring the fabric, which we'll get to later. So before you buy a lot of fabric you're unsure of, it's a good idea to try dyeing a small piece and see what happens. Some fabrics are labeled PFD. This is short for prepared for dyeing, which means the fabric has already been scoured. Since we're learning, we'll use 100% cotton t-shirts. Whenever possible, try to buy t-shirts that are sewn with cotton thread. Non-cotton thread will show up white and undyed when you complete your project. Now that we've selected our dye and fabrics, let's look at the rest of the chemicals we'll need. We'll need water softener, urea, kelp, soda ash, synthropol, salt, and vinegar. Water softener is the most overlooked ingredient in making bright, color-fast tie-dye. Water softener is important to use because virtually all tap water and well water contains water hardness in the form of dissolved minerals. These minerals get deposited on the fiber you are dyeing and block the tie-dye from bonding. Every time you use water in the tie-dyeing process, you will need to soften it. You could either treat your water with a softening chemical or a reverse osmosis softener. Either of these methods works just fine. Unless you have an expensive reverse osmosis softener, you'll need the chemical water softener. You can purchase this chemical from your dye supplier, who also calls it sodium hexametaphosphate, or you can buy Calgon at the supermarket. The next chemical we will be using is urea. We will be using urea mixed with water to make our dye premix solution. Urea allows us to dissolve more dye into our premix solution. Urea is available from dye suppliers. You can also obtain it seasonally through garden supply and farm stores where it is sold as fertilizer. If you do buy your urea from a garden or farm shop, make sure you inspect it to be sure it is of adequate purity. Your urea should be white. Urea with a yellowish or brown color is unacceptable for our purposes. If you are planning on making only one or two shirts, you will want to buy about one pound of urea. If you are making more tie-dyes, start out by buying at least five pounds. The next ingredient we will need is kelp, also known as sodium alginate. Kelp is used to thicken our dye premix solution. You will use this thickening effect to help control how far the dye spreads through the fabric. You can buy sodium alginate through your dye supplier, or you can buy powdered kelp at almost any natural food store. Two to four ounces will be plenty to get you started. The next chemical we need is soda ash. Its chemical name is sodium carbonate. Soda ash is also referred to as fixer. Its purpose is to shift the pH of the dye reaction from neutral to basic, creating optimal conditions for the dye to bond with the fiber. Soda ash and dye should not come into contact with each other until the dye is being applied to the fabric. Never mix soda ash powder or solutions with dye powder or solutions. Soda ash can be purchased through your dye supplier or you can purchase it at stores that carry swimming pool supplies. Buy only 100% soda ash. If you will be dyeing only one or two shirts, buy one pound of soda ash. If you will be dyeing more, then buy at least five pounds. The next chemical you will need from your dye supplier is Synthropol. Synthropol is a pH neutral detergent which is used in washing out tie-dyed fabrics. It helps to prevent staining areas that are intended to be white or light colored during the washout. If you are only dyeing one or two shirts, buy the smallest amount of Synthropol you can. If you will be dyeing more, start out with a pint or a quart of Synthropol. Another ingredient we will need is non-iodized salt. We will need salt to mix with the black dye. 
It helps the black dye bond more evenly and look blacker. The last ingredient we need is vinegar. Any kind works, so the cheapest is the best. The second time we wash out our tie-dye, we'll wash it with two cups of vinegar. This helps set the color in the shirt. Now let's review the supplies we've just talked about. You will want as many white, 100% cotton shirts as you're planning to dye. For dye, you will need 2 ounces to 1 pound each of fuchsia red MX-8B, yellow MX-8G, turquoise MXG, cobalt blue MX-2G, and black MXCWNA, or whichever black your supplier says is the darkest. You will need a pound or more of a chemical water softener unless you have a reverse osmosis softener. You will also need 1 to 5 pounds of urea, powdered kelp, 1 to 5 pounds of soda ash, 1 pint to 1 quart of synthropol, non-iodized salt, and vinegar. Before we talk about the other things we'll need for our project, like squeeze bottles and measuring spoons, let's get a picture of how we're going to use all these chemicals we've bought. We're going to wash our shirt in cold water with some water softener mixed in. Then we'll fold it into a design we like and tie it. It will be soaked in our soda ash solution mixed from water, water softener, and soda ash. Next, we will make a dye premix solution with water, water softener, urea, and kelp. We will add our dye powders to the dye premix solution, mixing concentrates of all of our primary colors. When we mix black, we will add salt. We'll mix more colors with various concentrations of our primaries in black, and by diluting them with water. Once our fabric has had enough time to soak in the soda ash solution, we will take it out and dye it. When our dyed fabric has had long enough to react, we'll cut off the ties. Wash out the shirt using Synthropol, hot water, and then cold water. After the shirt is dried, we'll wash it with vinegar and warm water. Everything we're using in this presentation, when handled properly, can be safely disposed of down the drain, regardless of if you're connected to a septic system or a city sewer. You'll want to dilute anything you pour down the drain with water. Before you start pouring any soda ash solution down the drain, Keep in mind that it can be stored indefinitely, so if you're planning on tie-dyeing again, you can store it in a closed container. Before we get into the rest of the equipment we need, let's talk about the workspace. A garage, laundry room, or workshop works the best. Avoid working in a carpeted room if you can. You will also want to be in or near a room with a sink and a drain. Cover any surfaces that might stain with lots of newspaper, cardboard, or plastic. Crochet and dye will stain all kinds of surfaces, including wood, stone, grout, and concrete. A plastic table like this one makes an excellent work surface because you can wash it off instead of having to cover it. You will also need a water heater and a washing machine. If you don't have a water heater or it doesn't get the water very hot, you can boil water on the stove to get by. Before you start boiling water, check the water heater. You probably just need to turn it up. You will also want a good supply of rags. Old towels work best. Also, remember to work in a well-ventilated area. Let's review the supplies we've just discussed. We need a workspace, hot water, access to a washing machine, some cardboard, newspaper, or plastic, and some towels. A plastic table also comes in handy. Now we'll go over some more materials that you will need in the tie-dyeing process. 
The first item is a good pair of sharp scissors. A small pair works best, but if a large pair is all you have, they will do. The next thing we need is a roll of wax thread, commonly known as imitation or artificial sinew. It's available in flat and round. We recommend flat imitation sinew. It can be purchased from leather goods suppliers and some craft stores. Next, we will need a measuring cup with standard or metric gradations. It is fine to borrow one from your kitchen. We will just make sure it doesn't come into contact with any of our dyeing chemicals. You'll also need a permanent marker. We'll be using it to mark volume measurements on the plastic containers we'll talk about next. You will also need a package of washable markers. We'll use these for drawing temporary designs on the fabric. We will need two plastic one gallon jugs. You may use empty milk jugs, water jugs, or vinegar jugs. We will use one jug for mixing our dye premix solution and the other jug for softened water. We'll also need at least one two gallon bucket with a lid. We'll use this for mixing our soda ash solution. If your sink isn't in your work area, you'll want a few more buckets to hold water for rinsing and cleanup. Next, we'll need some wide mouth plastic bottles with lids, preferably dispenser lids. We recommend wide mouth bottles so you can transfer dye powders directly to the bottle with a measuring spoon. We recommend you find a bottle that holds two to four cups of liquid. You'll want to have at least five of these. The best wash bottles are available through scientific or plastics companies. We will also need smaller squeeze bottles with spouts on the lids. We will be using these bottles to mix colors using the dye concentrates from the wide mouth bottles. We will also mix dilutions in these smaller bottles. Eyedroppers come in handy for applying dye precisely. We'll also need four plastic cups. These don't need lids, but should be big enough to hold at least one cup of liquid. We will use one for measuring our urea, one for measuring our soda ash powder, one for measuring our dye premix solution, and one for dispensing our soda ash solution. Keep these cups separate from each other, preferably in the container with each chemical. The next group of plastic containers we need will be used for storing any chemicals that came in a bag. It's also important to use a permanent marker to label the contents of each plastic container. We also need a shallow plastic box with a lid. If a box like this doesn't fit into your budget, use a shallow cardboard box lined with a plastic bag. We will be using these boxes to set our project in as it is being dyed. We will use a wire grid made from a couple of pieces of wire shelving held together with cable ties to set our project on while it's being dyed. Alternately, we can use a piece of egg crate louver commonly used in fluorescent lighting fixtures. The next item we will need is some measuring spoons. You'll want a tablespoon and a teaspoon. Another item we'll need is a funnel with an opening about the same size as the opening of the gallon jug you'll be using. We also need a stir stick or a whisk for stirring our soda ash powder into water. Let's go over all of that and make a list. We need scissors, flat imitation sinew, a measuring cup, a permanent marker, washable markers, two one gallon jugs, one two gallon bucket, and additional buckets as needed for rinsing and cleanup wide mouth bottles, squeeze bottles, eye droppers, four plastic cups, plastic containers for storing chemicals, one or more shallow plastic boxes with lids, some wire shelving and cable ties to build a grid or egg crate louver, measuring spoons, a funnel, and a whisk. If you decide to construct a grid, you'll also need to borrow some bolt cutters. Now we'll talk about some things that come in handy for tie-dyeing, but aren't essential. For folding a spiral design, a fork makes getting started easier. We pounded ours flat. If you decide to dye items made from rayon, silk, or gauze, you'll want a mesh bag to wash them in. Mesh bags are commonly used for washing delicate items like sweaters and lingerie. If you have leftover dye solution, which you would like to use later, fill a cooler with some ice to keep them cool. 
A small refrigerator will also work and will keep you from having to buy ice. At room temperature, dye solutions begin to lose strength after only three hours. If we store them in a cooler, on ice, or in a refrigerator, they can be stored and used for two weeks or more. A microwave is also useful because it accelerates the dye reaction. Rather than having to let your project sit overnight and wait to wash it out, you can have it ready in a few minutes. When you microwave a project, place it in a plastic container or a plastic bag to keep moisture from escaping. If too much moisture escapes, dry fabric will scorch and burn. A covered t-shirt can be microwaved for about three to five minutes on a high setting. Microwaving silk dyed with Persian MX dyes sets the dye, resulting in bright, vibrant color. It is not safe to use a cooler, refrigerator, or microwave for food preparation or storage after it has come into contact with dye and chemicals. A wet-dry shop vac can also come in handy for removing excess dye from the project box. Alternately, you can use your towels or rags to soak up excess dye. Let's take another look at the optional equipment. A fork, a mesh bag, a cooler with ice or a small refrigerator, a microwave, and a wet-dry shop vac. Let's talk about safety and personal gear for tie-dyeing. Unlike the group of optional items we mentioned, safety gear is essential and should be worn every time we handle any dye or chemical. You will need gloves, a dust mask, goggles or safety glasses, an apron, a chemical material safety data sheet, some clothing you will use only for tie-dyeing, and a pair of rubber-soled shoes. Several different types of gloves will work for your project. Kitchen gloves, disposable latex, nitrile, or vinyl gloves are all highly recommended. A dust mask should be worn when mixing powdered chemicals and dye. You will want a pair of goggles or safety glasses so you don't get any dye or chemicals splashed into your eyes. An apron will help to keep you clean and dry. Obtain the Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS, for each chemical you purchase, which will explain specific risks involved and what to do in the case of an emergency. For clothing, we recommend something you don't mind being splattered with dye. It is also best to cover as much of your body as possible. If you do get dye on any part of your body, you can wash it off with soap, warm water, and a washcloth or scrub brush. Concentrated dye can stain your hands for several days unless you wash it off immediately. Wearing a double layer of gloves reduces the chance of staining your hands. Finally, you will need some shoes with rubber soles. The floor will become slippery if something gets spilled. Be sure to wear good shoes and wipe up spills immediately. To mark our plastic containers, we're going to use volume-based measurements. They're easy, quick, and accurate enough for our purposes. Mass-based measurements are technically more accurate, but they require an expensive scale and additional steps. Let's mark the measurements we'll use directly on our mixing containers. We'll need the two identical one-gallon jugs, the two-gallon bucket, a measuring cup, the four plastic cups, and a permanent marker. First, fill one gallon jug entirely with water. Pour half of that water into the other gallon jug. When the water levels in each are exactly the same, use the permanent marker to draw a straight line at the water level on each jug. Pour the water from both of the half-filled jugs into the two-gallon bucket. Label the mark on one empty jug, one half gallon, again using the permanent marker. Now write dye premix solution on the jug. Under this, write add two teaspoon water softener, one teaspoon kelp, and two cups urea to one half gallon of hot water. Label the mark on your other jug half gallon. Write softened water on it. Under this write, add two teaspoons water softener to half gallon of warm water. Let's mark the two gallon bucket. 
with a straight line at the water level, then pour out the water. Mark the bucket Soda Ash Solution. Under this write, add 4 teaspoons water softener, 1 cup soda ash to 1 gallon warm water. Finally, using your measuring cup, add 1 cup of water to 3 of your plastic cups. Mark the water level of each cup with a straight line, then pour out the water. Now label each cup to say, 1 cup. Label 1 cup urea, 1 cup soda ash powder, and 1 cup dye premix solution. The fourth plastic cup is for dispensing soda ash solution. No measurement is necessary for this cup. Now we will begin mixing our chemicals and dyes. Only mix chemicals and dye outside or in an extremely well ventilated area. To make our dye premix solution, we're going to dissolve urea in really hot water. So make sure your water heater is turned up and give the water adequate time to get hot. Fill your dye premix solution jug with hot water up to the half gallon line. Using your measuring spoon, add two teaspoons of water softener and one teaspoon of kelp. Using the plastic cup marked urea and the funnel, add two cups urea to your jug. Put the cap on the jug and shake it until everything is dissolved. Set this solution aside until it cools. Although we need the water very hot to dissolve urea, the premix solution needs to cool to room temperature before we add our dye powders. Mixing dye powders into a hot solution will weaken them substantially. While we wait for the dye premix solution to cool, we'll take the jug labeled softened water, fill it with lukewarm water to the line. And add two teaspoons water softener. Put the cap on the jug and shake until the water softener is dissolved. Now we will fill our soda ash solution bucket with lukewarm water up to the line. Add four teaspoons water softener. and one cup of soda ash powder. Stir with your whisk until soda ash and water softener is completely dissolved. When dissolving water softener, urea, or soda ash in water, always mix the dry or powdered chemical into water. Never attempt to dissolve by adding water to dry soda ash, water softener, or urea. While we give our dye premix solution a bit more time to cool, we can wash the fabric we're going to dye to prepare it for folding and tying. If you're confident you can dye your fabric without scouring it, pre-fill your washing machine with cold water, 
Add one half cup water softener for a small load, three quarters cup for a medium load, and one cup for large loads. Let the machine agitate until the water softener dissolves. Then add your fabric to the machine. If you're pre-washing a delicate fabric, don't forget to put it in a mesh bag. Allow the machine to agitate fully and spin it out manually without giving it a chance to refill. Now your fabric is ready to fold. If you do suspect that your fabric might have additives or finishes applied to it, or if you're dyeing silk, you'll want to scour it. Before you begin scouring, make sure your water heater is turned up. Pre-fill your washing machine with hot water. Add water softener in the same amounts we used for a regular pre-wash, plus one teaspoon Synthrapol and one teaspoon soda ash for every yard of fabric you'll be scouring. Two t-shirts is about one yard. Put your fabric into the washing machine and allow the machine to run through an entire hot cold cycle. Don't forget to add more water softener to the washing machine after it fills up for the last time. When the machine finishes, your fabric is scoured and ready to fold. Once the dye premixed solution has had adequate time to cool, we are ready to mix our dye concentrates. If you dedicate a wide mouth bottle to each color, you may want to label each bottle with its color name. Black and cobalt can easily be mistaken for one another in concentrated form. When we transfer our dye premixed solution to our wide mouth bottles, we will use the plastic cup marked dye premixed solution to measure it. Pour your premixed solution into the plastic cup up to the line. Now pour the premixed solution into your wide mouth bottle. Repeat this process for each of the wide mouth bottles. The first color we are going to mix is lemon, yellow MX8G. Add two tablespoons of the dye powder to the premixed solution. Put the lid on the wide mouth bottle and shake it vigorously until all of the dye powder is completely dissolved. Wipe off the measuring spoon before mixing the next color. To mix the fuchsia, red MX8G, add two tablespoons of dye powder to the premixed solution. Put the lid on and shake it until all of the dye powder is dissolved. To mix turquoise, MXG, add three and a half tablespoons of dye powder to the premix solution. Put the lid on and shake it until all the dye powder is dissolved. To mix cobalt, blue MX2G, add three tablespoons of dye powder to the premix solution. Close the lid and shake vigorously.
For black, MXCWNA, add four and a half tablespoons. and two tablespoons non-iodized salt to the premixed solution. Close the lid and shake vigorously. If any of your dye concentrate solutions won't dissolve completely, you can add up to 10% softened water to help them dissolve. If you have additional dye colors to mix from powder, mix 2 tablespoons dye powder to 1 cup dye premixed solution for purples, oranges, and earth tones, and 3 tablespoons dye powder to 1 cup premixed solution for blues and greens. Whenever handling dye powders, be sure to replace the lid on each container as soon as you have finished measuring from it. This will reduce the amount of dye powder that can become airborne dust. Clean up any powdered dye or chemicals you spill immediately before the mess can spread. Now that we've finished mixing our dye concentrates, we can apply them to the fabric directly, use them to mix other colors, or dilute them to lighter shades. We can dilute any color we choose, including colors we've mixed from two or more primaries. Whenever you dilute a color solution, use only softened water. Never dilute with dye premixed solution. Diluting with dye premixed solution is not advised since this alters the ratio of urea to powdered dye, which we've already carefully established. Never dilute a color with soda ash solution. Dye exposed to soda ash will become inactive in a few hours. Let's take a look at mixing a few important colors from our concentrates. To make red, squirt or pour some of the fuchsia dye into a squeeze bottle from the wide mouth bottle. Use about two-thirds fuchsia to one-third yellow. To make orange, squirt or pour some of the yellow dye into a squeeze bottle from the wide mouth bottle. Use about 90% yellow to 10% fuchsia. Now let's make two purples. Experiment with different ratios of fuchsia to turquoise and fuchsia to cobalt. Or mix all three until you find some purples you like. Alternately, you can mix blue and or turquoise with the red we just mixed for an entirely different range of purples. We will make different shades of green from various mixtures of yellow, turquoise, and cobalt. Make any color darker by adding a touch of black.
Using softened water, you can expand your color palette by making dilutions of various strengths from each of your colors. For example, fuchsia can be diluted to nearly any shade of pink. Now that we've got our system in place, we can focus on the creative, artistic aspects of making incredible tie-dye. We've gone over all the supplies that you'll need. At the end of this video, we'll show you a list of suppliers where you can obtain these materials. Our website, www.truetiedye.com, also has all of the resources on where to get dye, chemicals, supplies, white clothing, and fabrics. Let's start with our most basic technique and experiment with making various gradations. First, we'll make our morning sky gradation using different hues and dilutions of blues and purples. Then, we'll make our rainbow river gradation using colors from the entire spectrum. Start with a damp, pre-washed t-shirt. Turn the shirt inside out. Fold it in half along the center, with the front of the shirt to the inside. Straighten out wrinkles along the crease. Scrunch the fabric to form a series of ripples, while keeping the layers of the shirt from separating. Set the scrunched shirt in the plastic project box. Continue to arrange and pack the ripples you formed, creating finer details. Put on gloves and pour soda ash solution over the shirt until the fabric is completely saturated. Remember to replace the lid on the bucket when you're finished. Continue to arrange and tighten the folds in the soaking wet shirt. Then set the shirt aside to soak. Let's take one more look at the process of forming rippled folds and packing them together. Let's mix the colors we'll need for the morning sky gradation using the dye concentrates we mixed earlier. Start by pouring some fuchsia dye concentrate into a squeeze bottle. Add turquoise and cobalt to make a purple you like. Squirt some of this purple into another squeeze bottle and add softened water. We'll call this first dilution of purple the strong dilution. Pour some softened water into another squeeze bottle. Add a much smaller amount of purple, a dozen drops or so, to this bottle. We'll call the second dilution of purple our weak dilution. We also need a strong dilution of turquoise. And finally, a weak dilution of turquoise. Even dilutions containing minuscule amounts of dye can produce appealing colors. Remember, dye colors always look darker in the bottle, so make sure the colors you mix are slightly darker than what you're hoping for in your finished project. Now we'll apply the dye and create our morning sky gradation. Tilt the project box, allowing excess soda ash solution to drain away from the shirt. Apply your weak dilution of turquoise in a stripe across the center of the shirt. Apply your weak dilution of purple next. On the other side of your weak turquoise stripe, 
apply your strong dilution of turquoise. Add a stripe of your strong purple dilution next to the weak purple. Working outward, apply concentrates of turquoise, purple, and cobalt. Apply more cobalt next to the purple. Repeat the color sequence we just established until the shirt is completely covered with dye. If you want to store the project box flat, once you're finished applying dye, you can remove the excess dye and soda ash solution with a wet-dry shop vac. Alternately, you can use shop towels to soak up excess solutions. Put the lid on the box and set it aside. Here's what our finished project will look like after the washout. Next we'll dye the Rainbow River gradation. As soon as we mix, the rest of the colors we'll need. Mix red using about two-thirds concentrated fuchsia and one-third concentrated yellow. Mix orange from concentrated yellow and five to 10% concentrated fuchsia. Make dark red by adding black to some of the red we mixed. Finally, We'll make a golden yellow by adding a small amount of orange to concentrated yellow. As you prepare to dye the Rainbow River, don't forget to tilt the project box so excess soda ash solution and dye can drain away. Start by applying a stripe of yellow. Then apply orange, red, turquoise, and purple. Continue to apply colors in this relative order so they appear on the shirt in the same order they appear in the spectrum. Put a smaller stripe of dark red through the center of each red stripe, and a small stripe of golden yellow through the center of each yellow stripe before setting the project aside to react. Here's what our shirt will look like after it's been washed out. Notice the green, which formed right on the shirt where the turquoise and yellow ran together. Now let's try some designs using the V-stripe fold. We'll dye the rainbow tiger and wavelength designs while wet with soda ash solution and without even tying them. Then we'll tie some V-stripes, soak them in soda ash solution, and set them aside to dry. We'll use these to create our scaly rainbow dragon and ancient dragon designs. Start with a damp pre-wash t-shirt and turn it inside out. <laughs> Fold it in half along the center. Smooth out any wrinkles, especially those along the crease. Using the washable marker, draw a diagonal line from the sleeve shoulder to the center crease. Draw more guidelines parallel to the first. Draw another line perpendicular to these and form a new crease along it. Raise a fold along this crease. Pinch the shirt to raise more folds parallel to the original and pack the series of folds together. Keep the heights of the folds even, approximately one and a half to two inches. Continue to form folds in this fashion until the shirt is completely folded. Transfer the shirt to a plastic project box. Put on gloves and pour soda ash solution over the folded shirt until it is completely saturated. Let's take one more look at drawing guidelines and folding the V-stripe pattern. Now we'll create the Rainbow Tiger. 
Before we start dyeing, we'll add more purple to our color palette by mixing turquoise and cobalt with fuchsia. Also mix a distinguishable bluish purple using only turquoise and fuchsia. Tilt the project box so excess soda ash solution drains away from the shirt. Remove this excess solution with a shop vac or towels. Dye the underside of the folded shirt black. Tilt the box to drain away excess dye and display soda ash solution and remove them from the project box. Working out from yellow, apply orange, red, turquoise, cobalt, and purple. Put another purple stripe next to the red. Cover the rest of the shirt using the same progression, so colors appear on the shirt in the same order they occur in the spectrum. Notice how the dyes form intermediate colors as they mingle where they touch. Make light colored areas like yellow wide enough that they won't be lost as the dye spreads. Augment each red stripe with a narrow stripe of dark red and each yellow stripe with a narrow stripe of golden yellow. Accent each turquoise stripe with the bluish purple we mixed using turquoise and fuchsia. Tilt the project box, draining away more excess dye and display soda ash solution. Remove this mixture from the project box with your towels or shop vac. Put the lid on the box before setting your project aside to react. Here's what the finished Rainbow Tiger shirt will look like. Now let's create the wavelength design. We'll be using the same strong and weak dilutions of purple and turquoise we mixed for the morning sky gradations. Adjust the concentrations of these dilutions to suit your tastes. In general, strong dilutions, weak dilutions, and concentrated dye solutions just need to be easily distinguishable from one another in the bottle and when applied to fabric. Tilt the project box to allow excess soda ash solution and dye to drain away from your shirt. Apply your weakest dilutions of turquoise and purple. Working outward, apply the strong dilutions of turquoise and purple, followed by concentrates of turquoise and purple. Apply cobalt, and repeat this color combination until the entire surface of the shirt is covered with dye. Remove excess solutions before setting the project aside to react. Here's what the shirt will look like after it's been washed out. To create the next designs, draw guidelines and fold your damp pre-washed shirt in the same manner as the first V-stripes we folded. Pay attention to making the folds an even height. As you begin to tie the shirt, notice how easy it is to tie a knot before cutting any sinew from the roll. Space your ties about two to three inches apart. Your ties should be tight enough that they cause the shirt to compress. Cut the sinew far enough above the knot that the tails won't slip out should the knot loosen. Continue to add evenly spaced ties compressing the shirt. Never take your eyes off the scissors. Hold the sinew so your fingertips don't get too near and take care to not nip your shirt. When you finish tying the shirt, submerge it in soda ash solution for at least 15 minutes. When it's had plenty of time to soak, 
Squeeze out excess soda ash solution and set the shirt out to dry. It can take several days for a shirt to dry, so plan ahead. As we prepare to dye the rainbow dragon, let's add two colors to our palette. Mix a forest green using yellow, cobalt, and turquoise. And an avocado green using yellow and relatively smaller amounts of turquoise and cobalt. Now we'll dye the dried, soda ash infused shirt. Apply red, orange, yellow, turquoise, and purple. Repeat this combination, starting over with red. Take care to apply enough dye to penetrate the layers of fabric, but don't oversaturate. Notice how the dye spreads differently through the dried fabric. Continue to apply colors in the same order until the side you're working on is covered with dye. Within each red stripe, apply a narrower stripe of dark red. This is one practical method of making a color appear to have more depth. Then flip the project over. Apply your weak dilution of purple, then forest green, avocado green, cobalt, dark red, a strong or medium dilution of turquoise, and red augmented with dark red. Instead of repeating this progression, apply more colors in a new order. Dyeing each side of the project using different color combinations reveals the relationships between the folds we made in the shirt, resulting in complex alternating patterns which resemble scales. Avoid dyeing both sides the same color at the same point. As you decide what color to apply next, consider how it will look next to its neighbors on both sides of the project. There are countless patterns that can be produced just by changing the order and frequency of colors. As you add colors, notice how the dyes you've applied continue to form more colors as they creep together. As you gaze along the side of the folded shirt, you can begin to see what the alternating pattern will look like. This view also shows why it's important to not oversaturate with dye. If you apply too much dye, colors on opposite sides will run together. With a little practice, you will develop a feel for applying just the right amount of dye. When you finished applying dye, put the lid on your project box and set it aside to react. Here is what our finished Rainbow Dragon shirt will look like after it's been washed out. Now we'll create the ancient dragon, applying the principles we just learned to a different combination of colors. To make a shirt like this one, you'll need four earth tones, or shades of brown. To save time, you can use only two earth tones and make a dilution of each. You can mix your own earth tones from various combinations of three or more colors. Here we've mixed yellow with small amounts of orange and turquoise, resulting in a sienna, or yellowish brown. Adding more fuchsia yields burnt sienna, or reddish brown. By using relatively less turquoise in these mixtures, you can make ochre or mustard yellow and rust orange, which we'll also need. If mixing your own earth tones is too daunting, you can buy powdered dyes in earthen shades or substitute shades of gray mixed from various solutions of black. The folded project shirt has been infused with soda ash and dried. 
Apply a stripe of each of your four earth tones, working from lightest to darkest. Repeat the sequence as you cover the rest of the first side of your project. Flip your project over and apply dark red, rust orange, mustard or ochre yellow, avocado green, forest green, dilute turquoise, dilute purple, and purple. Repeat this sequence until the shirt is covered with dye. Here is what our finished Ancient Dragon shirt will look like. Imagine other V-stripe designs you can produce by using different color combinations. Next we will learn to fold the spiral design. We'll dye the ember spiral and the rainbow spiral while they are wet with soda ash solution. We will also allow some of our spirals to dry after they've soaked in soda ash solution. We'll use these to create our fire spiral and our nebula spiral and chimera. Using a washable marker, mark the heart area of your damp pre-washed t-shirt. This point will be the center of our spiral. Turn the shirt inside out. Notice the location of the mark you've drawn. It might not be where you expect. A fork is handy for starting a spiral, but you can also start one with your fingers. Whatever method you choose to start your spiral, twist the shirt in a clockwise direction at the spiral center. As the spiral pattern forms, arrange the folds so they are an even height and pack them together tightly. Continue to form the pattern by moving the shirt counterclockwise around the spiral center. When the spiral is several inches across, remove the fork and use the palm of your hand to hold the center stationary as you continue to arrange even height folds and pack them together. When the pattern reaches the edges of the shirt, rotate the center clockwise and use this torque to tighten the spiral as much as possible. Tie the spiral across its diameter. Remember, you do not need to cut sinew from the roll until after each knot is tied. Tie the spiral across its diameter again, perpendicular to the first tie. Keep the spiral flat as it compresses. Continue to tie the spiral across its diameter until there are no more loose edges. Let's take one more look at the process of folding and tying a spiral. Put the tied spiral in a plastic box and pour soda ash solution over it until the fabric is completely saturated. You can reuse excess soda ash solution as long as it doesn't get contaminated with dye. Now we'll dye the ember spiral. Once the shirt has had at least 15 minutes to soak, start by dyeing one whole side of the spiral black. Holding the shirt at an angle allows excess black dye and displaced soda ash solution to drip away. 
cover the other side of your spiral with yellow. Draw two pie-shaped wedges of red on top of the yellow. Because dyes are translucent, layering colors on the fabric can produce deeper, more vibrant colors. Apply orange wedges next to the red. Continue layering colors by bisecting each red wedge with a streak of dark red. Finish by bisecting the remaining yellow pie pieces with a streak of golden yellow. Put the lid on your project box before setting it aside to react. Here's what a finished ember spiral will look like after the washout. The other spiral design, will dye while wet with soda ash solution, is the rainbow spiral. Apply yellow, red, orange, turquoise, purple, cobalt, and dark red. Flip the spiral over and repeat this combination in such a manner that each color appears in a corresponding location on both sides. Here's what a finished rainbow spiral will look like. Now we'll dye a fire spiral. To create this design, the folded spiral needs to dry completely after being soaked in soda ash solution. Apply yellow, orange, golden yellow, red, dark red, black, turquoise, and purple. Flip the spiral over and repeat the color combination match colors to their corresponding location on the other side. Here's what the finished fire spiral will look like after the washout. To create the nebula, dry another folded spiral after soaking it in soda ash solution. Cover one side entirely in black. On the other side, Apply two wedges of turquoise, and cover the rest with red. Bisect the turquoise with a streak of purple, and draw dark red lines across the red areas. Here's what the finished nebula will look like. Let's advance and create the chimera. This spiral has been folded on rayon sheeting soaked in soda ash solution and allowed to dry. Apply red, orange, yellow, turquoise, and cobalt. Repeat this color progression until the first side is covered. Augment red wedges with dark red and flip the spiral over. To create an alternating pattern, we'll use different colors on this side. Apply a wedge of purple overlapping the intersection of turquoise and cobalt on the other side. Apply your rust orange mixed from orange, fuchsia, and a relatively tiny amount of turquoise, and your mustard or ochre yellow mixed from yellow and relatively tiny amounts of orange and turquoise. Apply avocado green, dark green, turquoise, and purple. Starting over with dark red, Repeat the sequence of colors until the rest of the spiral is covered. Here's what our finished chimera will look like. Remember, it's not important that your colors match ours exactly. Simply let the concepts of color mixing and arrangement you've learned guide you as you explore mixing your own colors. Here are examples of more designs you can create as you experiment with new color combinations.
After the dye has been applied to our projects, we need to set them aside while the dye reacts and bonds to the fabric. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit, a project should sit for 12 hours. At 60 degrees Fahrenheit, it will need about 18 hours to react. Temperatures significantly below 60 degrees can be too cold for the dye to completely react. So put your project somewhere warm. If you don't want to wait the standard 12 to 18 hours, cover your project and microwave it until it's hot. When dyeing silk, heat from microwaving is the necessary catalyst to achieve maximum color saturation. Avoid breathing fumes and steam burns by allowing the project to cool before you handle it. When the dye has had enough time or heat to react, it's time to cut off the ties and wash it out. The goals of the washout are to solidify the bond between the dye and fabric while washing away excess dye in such a way that no staining occurs. While especially visible in white areas, staining also dulls richly colored areas, so it's well worth trying to avoid. Start by turning your water heater all the way up and give the water plenty of time to get hot. Be careful to avoid scalding yourself. Refill the washing machine with hot water and carefully cut the ties off of your dyed fabric. Allow the machine to begin agitating and drop the fabric into the machine. If you're washing out a delicate fabric, remember to put it in a mesh bag. Allow the machine to agitate for about 30 seconds, then stop it and set it to drain and spin out. When the machine finishes spinning, refill it immediately with hot water. When it begins to agitate, add 2 teaspoons synthopol for a small load, 4 teaspoons for a medium load, and 6 teaspoons for a large load. Then let the washer run through an entire hot-cold cycle. When you can leave the washer unattended, it's a good time to rinse off your grid and project box. After the washout, hang the items out to dry or put them in the dryer. It's always best to hang dry delicate fabrics like rayon and silk. Don't forget to turn your water heater back down when the washout is finished. You'll save on your energy bill and prevent someone from getting scalded. When your project is dried, wash it again in warm water with vinegar. This will remove any loose dye that remains on the fabric and prevent it from staining when the fabric first comes in contact with perspiration or precipitation. We'll use one cup of vinegar for a small load one and a half cups for a medium load, and two cups for a large load. When your project has dried, it is ready to display or wear. If you finished your project and everything is turned out just as you planned, congratulations! It's time to make some more outstanding tie-dye. Unfortunately, things can go wrong, but don't worry. If there's a disaster, we'll just identify the cause and try again. Let's look at some common problems and their solutions. If your colors are vibrant, but you have more white area than you anticipated, you probably just need to apply a bit more dye. Conversely, if your colors have all run together and formed a muddy brown, you probably just need to apply less dye. The distance that the dye spreads is heavily influenced by the type of fiber you are dyeing and how it is woven. You will find that some fabrics produce the best results when dyed wet with soda ash solution, while others dye better when slightly damp or bone dry. You may find that you have the right amount of dye coverage, but the color seemed to lack intensity. This can be caused by a variety of factors, so let's go through them in order. First, confirm your fabric is a cellulose fiber, like cotton or rayon, or that it is silk. Polyester, including blends, and other petroleum-based synthetics can't be dyed using Prochian dye. 
Some cellulose and silk fabrics have surface treatments and finishes that can interfere with the dye reaction. Try to avoid buying treated fabrics. If you do suspect your fabric has been treated, try scouring it prior to folding and dyeing. Next, make sure you soak the fabric in soda ash solution for at least 15 minutes. Remember to never mix soda ash solution directly with dye solutions. They should only come in contact when the dye is being applied to the fabric. Also, confirm the dye solutions were either freshly mixed or had been stored on ice or refrigerated. If dye solutions sit out for too long, they will lose strength. When you have confirmed that none of these things is the problem, it's time to look at your water. You softened your water, but how hard is the water in your area? If your area is prone to extremely hard water, it is probably evidenced in some noticeable yellow staining in the sink, bathtub, or toilet. If you find yourself in this situation, you'll need to use bottled water in the place of softened water. You will need bottled water for mixing dye premix solution and soda ash solution, as well as for pre-soaking your fabric instead of a normal pre-wash. Alternately, you can opt to invest in a reverse osmosis water softener. If water hardness isn't the problem, consider chlorination. Heavily chlorinated water can dull colors, particularly blues. If you suspect your water is heavily chlorinated, allow it to sit in a bucket or other open container for 24 hours before using it to mix any solutions or use bottled water. Other potential culprits in the my colors aren't bright enough dilemma are time and temperature. Be sure your project has had enough time to react at a warm temperature. This means letting the dyed project sit for about 12 hours at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that with silk, it is essential to the dye reaction that you add heat through microwaving. When you microwave a project, it needs to be heated thoroughly to reach its maximum bonding potential. Turquoise and blues derived from turquoise are particularly slow reacting and will not reach their full intensity unless given enough time or heat to react. Our last common color vibrancy pitfall is staining. If the intended white or near white areas of your project have bluish or pinkish staining, you can bet that staining is reducing the vibrancy of more saturated colors as well. Procyon dye stains like this are nearly impossible to remove. If you ended up with a bad stain, let's figure out what happened so we can avoid it in the future. Did your project have enough time and temperature to react? If you wash your project out too soon, more unreacted dye will be present in the washout and increase the chances of staining. Did you pre-fill the washer, and was the water hot enough? The water in the washing machine should be hot enough that you see steam. Also, don't leave the fabric in the initial hot water rinse for too long before draining and spinning. 30 seconds is plenty of time. If you leave the fabric in the initial rinse for too long, the excess dye you're trying to wash away can stain the fabric. Did you use enough Synthropol? A little goes a long way, but you need to use enough to see a small amount of suds. Staining will also occur if you try to wash out too many projects at once, so be careful not to overload the washing machine. Chances are, one of these solutions will fit your problem, but let's look at more reasons your colors might not be as bright as you expected. It's difficult to judge how a color, especially one made from a dilution, will look on the finished project when it is being applied. This is because wet dye colors appear darker. To make your colors more intense, you may need to mix more dye powder into your dye concentrates, add less water when making dilutions, or both. Procyon dye colors can also appear somewhat different on silk and cellulose fibers. With some practice, you'll get a feel for how the colors you mix will appear in their finished state. There are an immense variety of powdered dye colors available, and many of these colors are difficult to produce by mixing the primaries we started with in our demonstrations. So if your budget allows, try expanding your palette of powdered dyes. Our last common problem to troubleshoot is the mysterious and seemingly random appearance of little spots or speckles of dye on our finished project. These can show up where you really don't want them, so let's look at their cause and some remedies. Dye freckles happen when the powdered dye hasn't been dissolved completely and when it precipitates. Precipitation can occur when dye solutions are refrigerated or stored on ice because the dye is less soluble in a cold solution. When the dyes are ready to be used, 
The containers can be placed in a warm water bath to warm the solutions and improve the solubility of the powdered dye. If solubility and freckling are a problem with room temperature dye solutions, you can add up to 10% dye premixed solution or 10% warm softened water to help the dye dissolve. Just remember, dye premixed solution is for dissolving powdered dye and not for making dilutions. If you're still having solubility issues, you can try dissolving the dye by gradually adding dye premixed solution to the dye powder while pasting them together with a spoon. You can also strain your dye solutions through coffee filters to remove any undissolved material. If you choose to strain your dye, don't add kelp to your dye premix solution. We hope you enjoyed watching our video, and we're glad that you've taken the time to let us share the basics of this wonderful art with you. The last secret to making extraordinary tie-dye, which we'll share here, is practice. In the course of your practice, we encourage you to move beyond what we've shown you. Explore mixing colors that you find appealing, and try combinations from your imagination. When you make something really unique, be sure to send or email us a picture. Although we've covered a lot of material, we've really only brushed the surface of what is possible with the dye. We'll share lots more techniques in Tie-Dye 202, Making Shapes with Tie-Dye, and Tie-Dye 303, all about mandalas, suns, and lotus blossoms. Until then, happy tie-dyeing! Thank <laughs> you.